Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Using AI to Easily Automate All of Your Correspondence Channels, whether it's paper, fax, email, chatbots, and so much more. I'm Teresa Resick, the Director of Product, uh, Market Intelligence Programs here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And joining me today are AIM's President, Peggy Winton, and from OpenText, we have Zachary Jarvanen and Jesse Freeman. And OpenText is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them very much for their support. And certainly, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. And as we get started here, just want to offer a few tips for participating in today's webinar. By joining the event live, you can resize the, the windows that you have in front of you. Um, I do encourage you to open group chat. That's one of the windows that did not default open. Um, it's in the list of, of uh, links across in those little widgets across the bottom. Um, but with group chat, you can uh, chat with each other and also with a few of us here at AIM. I do encourage you to download the resources we have for you, and that's to the right of the slide area. Um, ask questions of our speakers throughout our time today, and do that with the Q&A feature, and that's to the left. And we'll do our best to get to all of those questions later in our webcast. Uh, please take the survey, and I greatly value your feedback on how we did today. And the link to the survey is at, um, in the list of, of uh, icons across the bottom, and it will open at the end of the webinar for you. And this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. And now to introduce the speakers that we have with us today, um, Peggy Winton is the president of AIM. And with over 30 years of program, product, and business development experience, Peggy is responsible for the strategic, technical, and business direction of AIM. Peggy believes that marketing and technology are converging and moving to the forefront of the business in order to, to deliver the ultimate customer experience. And with this, businesses need to adapt to the world that has shifted from physical to data, technology, and automation. And then also joining us are two gentlemen from OpenText AI and Analytics Division. Uh, Zachary Jarbanen is the Head of Product Marketing, and Jesse Freeman is the Senior Solutions Consultant, and he's going to be providing a demo a little bit uh, later in our webcast today. So really looking forward to seeing that. And before I turn things over to Peggy to begin our talk today, we're going to invite all of you to come back to your keyboards and answer a couple of poll questions as we get things started here. And just want to know um, how you would answer this. How many different ways do your customers communicate into your organization, whether it's by you know, email, the, your contact us page, phone, fax, click to chat, new social media, um, paper, good old snail mail, portals, all the different ways that, that customers can interact with you. About how many different ways do you have that in, available to your customers within your organization? Is it pretty focused that you have only one or two available? Somewhat managed that there's three or four options for people to reach out to you? Is it even broader, four or five? Or do you just have everything under the sun, uh, five or more? So. Let's take a quick look at what your answers are here. And it looks like uh, I'm seeing about 61% where it's greater than five, where it's all kinds of imaginable sorts of ways that people can reach out to your organization. Um, and even about 19, 20% say that it's you know, somewhat managed. Um, and, and as I would suspect, a, a very small number say that it's uh, focused, that there's only one or two ways for people to reach out to you, to you within your organization. So let's take a look at part two of this poll question. And this is how many people within your organization, how many employees manage all of these types of interactions? Um, just a few, you know, from you know, one to 100 people, um, a little bit larger group, like 100 to 1,000 different people managing these interactions. Um, for the larger companies, would you say that you know, like 1,000 to 5,000 people have to deal with all of these interactions, or even larger than that, you know, more than 5,000? Um, and just thinking of all the different ways that people communicate with your organization, how many employees have to deal with those interactions? And we're just looking to see um, about how large the spread is here. And I'm going to go take a quick look at the answer with that. And 
and it looks like about 42% say that it's uh, that smaller manageable number from 1 to 100. Um, but then another sizable chunk say that like from you know 100 to 1,000 people have to deal with these interactions. So uh, it seems like a you know a few people dealing with a lot of the, a lot of different ways that customers can reach out to us. And um, this is where I'm going to invite Peggy Winton to come in um, and uh, offer her interpretations or, or um, get her opinions on these poll questions before we turn things over for her to begin her talk. Um, Peggy, how are you today? Well, fine, Teresa. Thanks so much. And this is really kind of a good reality check, I think, for us as we start our conversation today. In the first part, it's certainly reflective of the volume, velocity, and variety of information that is coming into our organizations today. Many of you have seen AIM's research on that topic, and we asked you to look ahead just two years from now and think about all of that swirling mass of information, so much of it is customer generated. And how much do you think it's going to grow in just these next two years? And you told us as much as five times. Well, I don't know about you, but we're already in the zettabytes of information that come across our desktops every day, and we've lost the ability to uh, even marginally keep pace with all of that. And that's why we're going to be talking about some of these tools today. Uh, we as humans have uh, just lost the ability to manage any of this at scale. The second part of our poll, obviously, um, depends on the size of your organization, but again, um, the key drivers of new innovation and use of some of the tools we're going to talk about are those of you within your organizations who are on the front lines of your customers, because it used to be that we were just um, content creators. Well, we're now consumers and we're brokers of that information from and between our customers. And that's one of uh, the aspirations and one of the demands, I think, as we look to um, continue on our digital transformation journey. So thanks for that input. And uh, I think that gives us a, a good baseline from which to start. So let's get an acronym or two out of the way here. Um, when we say AI, we mean artificial intelligence. And when we abbreviate ML, we mean machine learning. So artificial intelligence and its sidekicks, deep learning and machine learning, uh, are pretty much all the rage right now. Um, I'm sure you've seen it, that just about every technology product in the world uh, really now seems to uh, claim uh, to have artificial intelligence attached to it in some ways. And that's kind of ironic because AI has actually been with us for decades, not just months, as it might seem. And people have been thinking about this relationship between people and machines, oh, gosh, going all the way back to ancient times. And their objective in all of that was automating, in some ways, uh, their processes. And even what we'd consider true process automation goes back to the early 20th century. So it's not as uh, new as we might think it is. But certainly optimizing machine learning um, struggled to get off the ground for uh, a few years because of three um, kind of lacking ingredients, I'd say. One is a lack of computer power. The other is a lack of data. You really need large volumes, such as we're talking about, almost five times in our organizations, uh, growing by that in the next two years. You need a lot of that data so that you can establish patterns and, and uh, be able to teach those patterns. And the third lack was just a lack of resources. So obviously, all of that has changed now. Um, we now have those three necessary ingredients to be leveraged fully. So during this webinar, my job will be to um, cite some results of research that AIM recently conducted with you guys and your peers, and we want to thank you if you've taken part in any of those research studies of ours. Um, we take all the inputs. We uh, 
collate them and curate them. And that's what populates a lot of uh, our educational programs like today's webinars. And we publish the results of those. Um, I'm also going to include some key um, knowledge excerpts from one of AIM's training courses. You all know that we um, provide training on a variety of topics, and you can even take those online at your own pace. But one of them we're particularly proud of is the Emerging Technologies in Information Management course. A uh, little shameless promotion here, but I strongly recommend that any of you who are new to this concept of machine learning and deep learning take this course because it provides a really good, solid grounding in the core concepts. And I will say that you don't need to be a math major or a data scientist to understand what we're um, presenting there or how you can benefit from it. The real payback when we talk about AI comes from eliminating the need for manual big data processing. And the real fun, I think, is talking about what the primary drivers and the ideal applications for AI are. As Teresa mentioned, I'm joined today by Zach and Jesse, who are going to do just that. They're going to provide you uh, with some context from among the open tech customer base. And it is broad. And I dare say you will see uh, some organizations that look just like yours uh, throughout a variety of industries. We're going to look at some examples of how their customers are using uh, AI to automate correspondence and communication channels. And we're also going to take a little peek under the covers to see what are the tools um, and what do they look like. So much of the use of these tools now are not by IT experts. And many of us who are line of business owners or process owners, we're kind of tired of waiting in the queue for IT to get to us. And a lot of these new tools are user friendly. So we can become that citizen developer and uh, take matters into our own hands to really um, use the heft and the power of these tools to just improve our processes. And what processes are those? They're mostly the ones that are uh, customer facing because those are the new demands and the pressures that we're feeling. So let's take a look at um, where you all are. We asked you, um, where do you currently stand with your own AI foray or initiatives? And I think this help gives, uh, gives you a good baseline. It might help assuage any sort of concerns you might have, too, that you're lagging behind or uh, maybe you think that you're quite a trailblazer. For 81% of you, deep learning and machine learning you believe are key to your future technology and your digital transformation aspirations and potential there. Most of you realize that, that this is potential. I think you'd have to be uh, living in a cave somewhere not to feel um, those pressures and feel the effects of that big data explosion that we just talked about. But it's still in fairly early stage of adoption. A full 87% of you are only just exploring it, or you've recently just tested the waters. So don't feel badly if, if that's where you are. Um, uh, we said this has been around for a while, but only now do we really see that all those three necessary ingredients have come together to really do uh, what we need it to do in order to um, uh, take some of the guesswork and the human element out of this management of this information. This is much more important. When we asked you what you're using this for, why are you even experimenting with this? What are your primary drivers? 79% of you said that you appreciate the need to turn unstructured information. So those are things like documents and images and audio files and application files into structured data so that your machines can do something with it. You understand that to truly realize the promise of machine learning for heavy process automation lifting, your content has got to be in readable, structured form. Another data point, uh, not on a screen here today, but 
we talk a lot in this industry about unstructured information or semi-structured information and there was a lot of sort of urban legend around how much of that um, in our organization what percentage of it was unstructured i'm going to let zach talk about that because you have your own data point but we finally cleared it up uh, what percentage it is so zach what are you seeing uh, at open text what are some other key business drivers among your customers uh, thank you, Peggy, and we really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, on the line with AIM, a big partner, you know, a partnership uh, and, um, uh, for all of Open Text. And uh, like I said, I uh, work on the AI and analytics unit, so we're so happy to just shine some light on uh, what are some of the things we're seeing and some of the ways, like Peggy said, uh, that we will be, uh, you know, we can help you make, put these things into reality, right? Uh, AI shouldn't be something for us and in our perspective way off in the future, uh, rather something that uh, you can implement pragmatically to solve a business challenge uh, today. Answering your specific question, you know, for starters, Peggy, you know, we do see and we yeah, love the, the data points you are showing. We see many of the same, right? Just like Peggy was saying, big data challenges, right? People, we have terabytes and, and zettabytes, right, of, un, of structured and unstructured data. We do see uh, also, at, you know, and hopefully some of the folks on the loan, whether you yourself are C-level or, or you obviously work in an organization, right? But the C-level is adopting. They, they realize, hey, there's benefits. Uh, they, they see that there's potential value in AI. But, you know, the questions will be around, okay, how do we make this happen so that we get the operational efficiencies or the growth benefits or the new business model? And so that's kind of what we're centering around uh, our talk today. Obviously, regulation, you know, that evolving environment that we see both on the security side as well as with things like policy challenges around GDPR and CCPA. Great potential use cases that we all face every day that we could, can apply AI and machine learning uh, solutions to them uh, very pragmatically today, not someday in the future. The other kind of challenges, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, for getting started here, we obviously, right, we all live in this competitive marketplace, right? We're always, you know, whether we're competing against the guy down the street or, or the, you know, global uh, organization, enterprise that's, you know, shifting jobs around and these type of things, uh, we all face economic pressures. Uh, the data points we've seen, uh, uh, such as by Forrester, uh, always cites this, right? Insights-driven enterprises grow eight to 10 times faster than others. That is those that are taking analytics, taking predictions, applying those uh, to receive really um, uh, to for some sort of benefit for their company, those are the ones that win. And so, obviously, we'll be uh, when we get to the demo, we'll show a little bit about that. And we that's what we spend or that's what I spend my day uh, helping people with, right? Because we want them, uh, we want everyone to, uh, you know, in the in the community in our community to to see the same benefits. Obviously, a lot of things around, you know, uh, a lot of us don't realize, but we are always act interacting with with AI when it comes to personalizations. Uh, uh, that that's those are take, uh, capabilities that machine learning a lot unlocks. And again, like we we're saying before, folks now, you know, a few years ago, maybe less. Okay, we don't know about this AI thing now. They're saying, okay, there's benefits here, and so some of the questions. Uh, uh, that we see and we, we, we like to help people address are, okay, how do you tangibly receive those benefits or how, how can we be a partner to help you achieve uh, those end goals? Back over to you, uh, Peggy. And you're so right, Zach. I mean, again, we can put all kinds of labels on this, but at the end of the day, the, the end game here is digital transformation. We're, we're just, we all are on a digital transformation journey. And you're right. Um, the most important driver there is this ability to create and just unparalleled customer experience and to anticipate our, our customer needs, sometimes before they even know what they need. So you're right. There's the economic pressure and, and the consumer pressures that we've got to do it. So we asked you, um, how easy uh, how easy do you find this uh, ability to turn unstructured information uh, into structured data? We talked about what percentage that was, but 87% of you naturally find this task challenging because there's a huge backlog of, I guess I'd call it undigested content. And that's all that content that's just not currently addressable by machine learning engines. What have we got to do to convert that from unstructured information into structured data? So Zach, what advice do you have for 
overcoming this? And are there other obstacles that your customers have shared with you? Uh, you know it. Yep. And so we'll, we'll show a little bit or in the demo, we'll show a little bit about how it works. We also have in the resource link, you know, some of the technology so folks can even play with it. Um, but in terms of the challenges, we, you know, first just echoing your point on the challenges, right? We spend our days, uh, right? At a, at a gut level, we all understand this because we spend our days, right? All of us. Um, in emails and contracts and documents, you know, it's that that 80 uh, percent, you know, thereabouts that <clears throat> that Peg was mentioning amount of data. Right. We produce not only we produce, you know, the challenges, not only we produce uh, uh, as much data over the last five years as in the entirety of human history prior to that. Right. So the ex massive explosion, but that the 80 percent or some people will say it's a final frontier of data is unstructured. We architect, we believe AI and, and ML, or we've our, and we've architected ourselves, uh, should naturally process that, that that should be native from the beginning, that any AI engine or the AI engine that you, you, know, you may want to choose to tackle your challenges should be able to pra uh, process unstructured data just like stru structured data because that's the 80% of your data challenge that you need to wrangle. Um, uh, folks, you know, many of us spend our days, right? This is, again chatting on forms, downloading forms, scanning forms, emailing forms, on the phone, et cetera. All of that is either data that can be taken in to make a better prediction or optimize a process or automate a process or uh, 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 otherwise to inform better decisions, right? Uh, save you time, save, uh, uh, save your business money, uh, save uh, uh, take the, the data at scale and identify new problems. Ah, looks like there's this clause in the contract we've seen uh, that uh, gets this, uh, the, um, that invalidates a contract or makes us lose business every time. We didn't notice that until we scanned all of our contracts and identified and were able to correlate contracts that failed with a certain clause that text mining and machine learning analysis is able to do. Those are some of the, the, the types of challenge that we address. So as I was saying, you know, we believe um, and we've kind of taken the position in the market, you know, somewhat uniquely. Uh, not a lot of people uh, you hear a lot about big data. Uh, not a lot of people in the broader market really speak about uh, unstructured data. And so that's a, a special focus of ours is that any data, data be it the unstructured that I was mentioning, um, these these file types alongside structured big data. Yes, we do want to do that too. Any application data like Peggy was mentioning, and, and in our case, whether that's open text data like InCase or some other data like Salesforce, SAP, or the like, for any requirement, any deployment type, right? We want to help people with cloud, on-prem, hybrid, whatever they like, and for any style of analysis. That's kind of our vision uh, in the market, and we're, we're always building and enhancing um, our product and our solutions towards same. The other challenge, you know, Peggy's mentioned, hey, what are the, you know, what are what's getting in the way, right? Why why aren't people, why is there fits and starts sometimes? And so that's kind of what we'll, we definitely want to focus a little bit of time here on with our with the final section, um, but is around, we see that not only are people challenged by the data, but they're challenged by having a discrete use case or uh, a set of teams, some human capital to get it done. And so what we've been, for what we, where we focus in addition to offering a great platform that can handle any challenge is we offer solutions or we try to make it easy so that even if you don't yet have the team or pick a thing, uh, we, we can offer a discrete use. Uh, you, you do, but you can identify a use case. We offer you a, a discrete or offer folks a discrete kind of solutions where they can um, quickly uh, uh, get to value uh, with, uh, um, without needing a bunch of extra things. So that's what we kind of want to, uh, we definitely spend a lot of time helping guiding and, um, and explaining to folks, hey, do you have this challenge as well? If so, we can uh, quickly, within a, a discrete amount of time, uh, implement an AI and ML solution with you at your organization. Zach, that's great to talk about all of those typical um, sources, particularly the customer originating ones. So we asked you all, looking at all those different sources, are there some common targets 
uh, common processes that you are hoping to use machine learning for. Um, not so much from a, uh, uh, a functional or like horizontal kind of application, but just in general um, when it comes to your information. And look at these responses. Um, you are trying to prevent loss through um, any kind of usage patterns. Remember we said that in uh, years past, AI couldn't fully be leveraged because there just wasn't uh, a plethora of, of data, which you really need in order to establish those patterns. The machines learn and, and lots, of, uh, lots of data going in there just helps in that process. So 40% of you are, are hoping to do that. Um, you also want text analysis for better content classification and categorization. And that's where metadata comes in. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, um, metadata is sort of cool and sexy again um, uh, for the very important role that it plays in this sort of transition from unstructured to structured. Uh, better automatic understanding of the context you had mentioned contract uh, management, Zach, and that's a, a, a growing uh, target for so many of us. And uh, again, because of the demands our customers, they want access to that. It's not just uh, they send you sign a contract and it's hidden. It becomes almost a, a living dynamic thing. So what are some concrete cases? What does that mean? Give us some more uh, functional, those horizontal kinds of applications. Um, I think it's helpful given all the hype around machine learning. Um, machine learning can be used to solve real business problems. How about things like speech recognition, um, looking for the all important graphics and images, um, detecting fraud, um, and we know how powerful it is, and it's used every day. Uh, all of us are Amazon customers, and um, the recommendations from our peers or other co customers uh, has become one of the single uh, most influential factors in our purchases. So, Zach, again, looking at the open tech customers and with Jesse's help, give us some specific use cases. So these are some of those targets, but there are so many more um, in the everyday uh, processes that now our, our customers are so much a part of. Um, with Jesse's help, we're going to peek under the covers to see um, how do we become more citizen developers? What are these tools uh, look and feel like? I, we want to demystify that because they are becoming so much easier to use. And I always say, who better than the process owners to know how to improve the process? Yeah, thank, thank you, Peggy. Um, so there's there's a, a number of these processes that we, we really see becoming more and more prevalent and impacted by machine learning. And I think um, a, a really big one that we, we really kind of touched on today and that I'll show through the demo is um, talking about automating inbound correspondence. And as we, we saw from the poll questions at the beginning, um, it, it's becoming this huge thing, right? It, it's, it's every day growing to more and more sources, right? It's not just letters or just faxes, right? Everyone has so many of these different sources, be it um, emails, web contact forms, um, physical mail, right, chat, communication through those kinds of, of methods. And it's, it's becoming this very, very um, large and difficult to deal with situation where we, we need a way to automate a lot of that um, that's happening, a lot of that communication, how do we handle it and, and how do we go through it. Um, and that's where machine learning is becoming very, very powerful is we're able to automatically process a lot of that unstructured content, figure out ways to categorize it, route it, properly assign it to the right teams, um, and reduce the amount of manual intervention that's being required um, by so many people across so many different um, channels of communication. Um, so what we really see when we kind of think about this from a, a process flow perspective is the information is flowing in. Um, we're, we're digitizing content where needed. So when we do have some of those still traditional uh, print forms of media, maybe faxes that are coming across as images, things like that, um, we'll make sure it gets digitized and OCR'd. And then we use uh, machine learning and natural language processing to actually go in and 
extract the content out of all of that, determine what's inside of it, bring structured all of that unstructured data, and then be able to process it and derive very valuable insights out of it and automatically route that through the workflow to the appropriate locations and to the right teams um, who need to handle that type of information. And so what I can actually do um, is show you a little bit of this today um, in more of a demo type situation. And so what I have is a, a few different uh, pieces to walk through here um, around a demo scenario here. This is that automating inbound communication type situation. Um, and so what I have is a, uh, a web contact form for our open text website where a customer can go in, um, fill out the contact form, and then actually um, uh, you know, request something maybe happen. Um, and it needs to be processed. And so we, you know, you get a contact form that looks like this from the customer perspective. Um, I fill it out and then oftentimes um, that's that. I say, you know, maybe I'll get it being processed and then we need to, you know, wait for someone to reply back to me. And usually there's a, a time that it takes to get things moving like that. Um, well, if we submit this and using um, machine learning and having trained the system to automatically process that unstructured content, what we can do is give some immediate feedback to that customer who submitted that request. And we can tell them that we've automatically categorized this as a sales request and routed it accordingly, um, and you'll be expecting a contact from the sales team. Um, but then we can give the option for that customer to give us some feedback on our categorization. And this will help trigger a uh, kind of a real-time feedback situation where we can understand if that automatic categorization is appropriate or not, and then automatically trigger things like if um, maybe there is a problem, we can go ahead and automatically trigger a manual review so we can keep training the system over time should there be any challenges. In this particular situation, sales is the category we're looking for, um, so we can keep moving and, and take a little bit of a closer look at you know, what really happened under the scenes when that contact form was submitted. Um, so in a, a regular scenario, what we would see is um, some basic feedback like this, where when you submit a contact form or, or something on a website, you may get a little bit of information based on what those fields were that were completed. So we may get a name, an email, a phone number, um, but really what this is about, we don't know because there was, there was no drop downs about a category and all we have is a paragraph in the subject field that someone needs to manually read, um, understand what it's about and then help us route it appropriately. Well, what we can do is use that machine learning, do natural language processing on top of this and then derive some much richer analytics and insights out of it by using that exact same piece of information. So now what we see is instead of just a couple of those basic pieces, like uh, John Anders, the person's name, um, we get some much more detailed information, including things like places and organizations. Um, and when we noticed when the contact form was submitted, the customer didn't actually provide us the organization in the field we'd requested. However, because we were able to manually extract content out of that paragraph of text, we're able to extract his organization name based on the signature inside of that piece of text. Additionally, we're going to pull out a lot of very detailed information about the concepts that are being discussed um, inside of that piece of unstructured text. So that'll be things like we see artificial intelligence product, document capture, team lead, sales team. Um, so these concepts help us automatically categorize the content and understand what was really being discussed. And so that's how we've automatically assigned this to the category of sales. Um, we've done a sentiment analysis of the content and determined that it is a overall positive sentiment. And then using all of this information together, we're able to run it through uh, our uh, some machine learning and, and get us a priority level of four um, for this particular request. Um, so all of this information will be automatically tagged and routed to the sales team um, with all of this information pre-populated. So now someone doesn't have to manually review it. We don't have to figure out where to go. It all happens automatically. The information is pre-populated, and we've saved a dramatic amount of time and effort in having to process this request manually. If we take a little bit of a, a closer look, um, I'm just going to go back in, and in this particular uh, piece, all I've done is changed the actual text inside of it um, to now something, uh, instead of a request about a product, this is about an issue that's occurring. Um, so when we resubmit it, we do see the category change now to customer support. If we look at that kind of standard analysis, it does not appear anything's changed. We have a what would appear to be the exact same 
piece of information other than what's in that subject box and that paragraph that someone has to read. So un under that kind of standard traditional analysis, um, this looks exactly the same as the last one until someone gets in there and actually reads the full contents of that subject line. But when we use uh, AI and we use natural language processing to actually automatically process that piece of text and extract the content out, we get a totally different set of results where we'll actually see in those concepts things about a support ticket and having to do with the ingestion workflow in the capture process and document capture um, and from a team lead. So now we have a, a much different set of concepts that are being discussed inside of this request. And so we'll use all of this information together to now determine this is actually a customer support request. It has a negative sentiment and we've increased it to a priority level two based upon the issues that are occurring and, and the support request that has come in. So now this request that in that standard view, we can't differentiate, is going to automatically be routed to a different department with different information automatically attached to it. Um, and, and just to dramatically reduce that amount of time that's required to handle all of this communication. It just keeps growing and the more we can automate, the more we can automatically populate in. The, the better we'll be able to use our resources on those more important tasks that don't involve just manually reading paragraphs and trying to tag categories. Um, so then the, the last little piece here to look at is to kind of take this thing full circle um, and change my hat real quick. And we'll take a look at this from the back end perspective of uh, someone who's actually the, the now kind of one administrator of that system. So instead of all of these people manually reading all of this inbound communication, we're able to have a, a much um, more trimmed and focused team that is just about trying to manage that overall process and workflow and make sure things are moving successfully, keep track of the trends we're seeing and the kinds of submissions and any initiatives we have, and then go through the very important part of handling those few manual reviews that are still required. So what we'll see is, is for this process, um, we have about 230 submissions that have been automatically processed already, and there's about 27 left that still need to be manually reviewed. Um, so we're at about the 90% range when it comes to automating this inbound communication, which is very, very good. Um, but we want to keep refining that as um, we work through the system and keep training the model to improve over time with maybe changes to our customer base or changes we even have in our own content. And so what I will do is that user who, who does go through and look at those few that need to be manual re, manually reviewed, I can drill into that report, take a look at what is standing in my manual review queue, drill into one, and actually look at what's there. Um, in this case, it is actually a request to uh, schedule a demo about a product and maybe wanting to look at evaluating. Um, so in this case, it is not a general inquiry. It is actually a sales request, so we would change the category appropriately and then resubmit this request um, back into our new corpus of training so that we can use this as an example um, for a sales training in the next round we go through um, with a, an update to our machine learning and our underlying taxonomy. Um, so this has really been a way to show automating that whole process of inbound communication, everything that flows in. In this case, we looked at a contact form, but this same process really works for just about any kind of inbound communication, um, be that things, as we said, like emails, faxes, um, physical documents that are being mailed to you. Um, this could be actually coming out of a, uh, another type of a workflow. A any kind of inbound communication that's coming through can be automatically analyzed, have the content extracted, and then be routed appropriately using these types of machine learning and natural language processing tools to bring structure to that unstructured content and give us these insights that are requiring manual intervention today. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn things back over to, I believe, Zach, who's got a couple of follow-ups. You know, uh, thank you so much, Jesse. And, and we do want to take, you know, any questions if they're, if they're coming in in the chat, or we'll do that at the end. But uh, uh, like Jesse saw, hopefully that kind of uh, elucidates, right, how it can happen um, from start to finish. Uh, like Jesse was mentioning, right, it can happen for any, any type of process. He used specifically this, I have a few here, uh, but in the interest of time, I won't go uh, deeply through them, right? But 
as Jesse was describing, right, certainly this happens, uh, can happen very naturally for a contact form. Similarly, that could be broadened and applied to the entirety of enterprise correspondence um, from the intake of uh, in paper channels as well as digital channels, right? We, we can augment the capture process by reading, uh, in addition to OCRing it, reading the text and reading based on the text in the letter. Uh, and then uh, uh, whether that's alone rooting, or in addition to rooting it, also persisting that data in the storage side of things. Uh, so a ton of things we can do there. We also apply that on the storage side for things like smarter migrations. You're moving from one service to another. You don't want to keep a legacy set of um, uh, again, petabytes of redundant, outdated, and trivial data for the records managers in the room. Uh, how can you handle that uh, with our smart migration process? We read through the entirety of your stack. Um, for those who aren't uh, uh, familiar with this challenge, how many times do you do we download that same set of content again and again? Um, and so identifying what's redundant, outdated, and trivial so you can do a more smarter uh, migration, a more smarter enterprise correspondence, or even things like uh, customer uh, vendor uh, and employee onboarding, right? Same type of thing, right? It's an input channel of a document that comes in. Uh, you need to extract certain fields. Uh, we need to uh, analyze whether there's any sort of risk. We need it rooted if it's an I-9 or a, a driver's license in the case of an employee's rooted to the right file uh, uh, and processed accordingly. So tons of ways that we can apply the same type of technology to different kind of sub use cases uh, for folks to get to benefits. <clears throat> the who's doing it? Uh, we have huge banks, we have huge government organizations and the like all kind of making benefit of this now. Anyone with a lot of correspondence, which really is all of us right today, um, uh, you know, professional services organization, et cetera, um, and beyond, right? Whatever, every industry we see kind of getting the value of that, especially recognizing what kind of PEG identified, you know, is the challenges we see, we all see. Um, and so that's uh, a little bit of that. Looking at the time, I'll just skirt quickly here. The final thing we didn't have time to talk about today, but we do as well, uh, and we would be happy to follow up with anyone who would like to see it. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, as the title of the webinar talked about, um, chatbots as well. Um, you know, people have gone, uh, become conversational, right? They like, instead of just simply providing, sometimes we do, a give me the, or, uh, 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 you know, writing a, uh, searching for a certain document um, and, and having that render. Sometimes we like to ask. That's why we ask our colleagues, hey, have you seen this? Do you know where that is? And so we've taken some of that same technology uh, and or that same thinking that we normally do as humans and apply that to rendering you better answers from your content even if it's within an open text content store or something like that. Um, you know, we call it virtual assistant or knowledge assistant. Uh, it's a chatbot like interface uh, uh, to, to render you better information from your content like you would uh, render better uh, customer service uh, to folks via chatbot as well. Uh, and so we, we're showing folks that these days as well. People think it's really interesting. Kind of a different, you know, I know uh, Peggy before the call was asking, hey, what are some other things that people are thinking of? Well, well certainly automating enterprise correspondence, certainly uh, content form, certainly onboarding, be that customer, vendor, or uh, employee, and even some new ways we're thinking about applying AI and machine learning. And we have an example here around uh, the virtual assistant. Back over you to, to you, Peggy. I'm struck by the democratization of all of this. Um, I couldn't help but think when Jesse was taking us through the demo how um, simple and clean a lot of these uh, tools are. Um, you know, using declarative kind of features and drop downs that we're all used to working with every day. Uh, anyone uh, within our organization can be empowered to do this. And again, we're customers and consumers ourselves within our own organizations, and we're serving uh, consumers all the time. So that takes me back to, you know, why are we doing all of this? And uh, back again to this end game. Um, one 
of the things that came out in some discussions we had a few years ago is, yeah, we can define digital transformation in all kinds of ways, but the true digital transformation leaders are those organizations that make it really easy to do business with. And I think um, being able to have access to these kinds of tools within our organizations um, means that all of those different uh, omni-channels, sources of our customer inputs, all of the people you said are touching that information every day, we can finally do something about it and do something at scale so that we become that organization that's really easy to do business with. And um, if customer experience is the starting point, um, we have three other, I think, digital transformation aspirations that flow from that. Um, we've been talking so much about improved business agility, freeing up our workers from the drudgery so that they can really be innovative and creativity. That's how we create new products and services uh, that will uh, disrupt someone else's business because it's a better mousetrap. Um, we need operational excellence so that we don't keep our customers waiting, so that we get to deliver those products and services in the way that they want. And we have to do all of that. One of you submitted a question, what about the compliance uh, or the governance piece there? Uh, well, let's face it, we as humans are lousy at doing those kinds of things. We don't want to um, have to tag things and categorize things, and these uh, tools can be trained to do that for us and and achieve a much better uh, success rate at it. So, you know, we call this whole set of methodologies and tools intelligent information management. And I think a key consideration in thinking about AI and machine learning is the recognition that it's not an end in itself. Um, when you think of IIM, um, it's a two-way street with m machine learning. They're each reinforcing the other. So we really need to ask ourselves, how can AI and machine learning be used to improve uh, that sort of three-legged IIM stool of content, process, and analytic services capabilities? And how can content, process, and analytic services capabilities be used to improve the input? to machine learning. In other words, how can capabilities to turn unstructured information into structured data be used to just improve that performance? So we asked you, what really ultimately is the most important benefit you are hoping to achieve from utilizing these kinds of capabilities? And 43% of you said, um, you know, I want to automatically apply privacy and retention policies. We're all under much more pressure to protect our um, consumer, consumer uh, and customer data. And um, again, nobody wants that responsibility. Nobody wants the, the drudgery of uh, manually tagging. So Zach uh, and Jesse, uh, love to get some final words of advice from you. What would you say to uh, folks on the call who are just getting started? Is there uh, maybe a reality check in there somewhere um, that, to be mindful of? I, yeah, I don't, I, you know, getting started is a great place to get started. Start with a start. The, you know, the, and the reason I say that is I, folks, you know, as we saw at the beginning, right, there's value to be had. And so, we would we want to make sure that people, you know, are grounded and in, in, in guided guided towards getting to the right solution. But it should also be very apparent, or we want we want to make sure that they get there because their competitors are right. So we don't want we would definitely you know are are fans of getting started, and and we and other organizations you know uh, help you along the way. Or I know that our goal is to help make sure people are successful. Um, as as you said earlier, uh, Peggy, you can play with it yourself, right? So we, if you if you're somebody who like, okay, I still want to you know see it in action myself. We try to make that easy. So we have this URL here on the screen. Uh, folks can just copy in a simple document uh, and hit analyze and 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 or we've done it fun ways. You right, take one of your organization's blogs or take one of your you know some of the type of uh, correspondence or other type of document type that you look at a lot and see, hey, is the engine good? Can it 
handle certain things? Can it pull things like people, places, things? Uh, can it understand positive and negative and other sentiment? Uh, and so we want to we expose that for everyone at a single document basis uh, so folks can kind of try it out for themselves. So we do, uh, you know, to, to our both of our earlier point, like, you know, uh, to become familiar, demystified for people. Uh, and then, of course, where this gets really interesting is that scale, right? When you can apply that, when you can ramp that up to the entirety of your document store, the entirety of your uh, enterprise correspondence process, et cetera. In addition, in, in terms of other ways to kind of get, you know, if you want to learn more, uh, we have a ton of resources, right? We love to just help people in their, you know, uh, as they gain knowledge uh, along that journey, become more sophisticated um, uh, in the way they are, to, you know, learn and, and are, are able to articulate the challenge and whatnot. And so we have a set of materials here, and I know some of these are in the resources link and, and will be set out and are on our site uh, in, the, in the AI and analytics section, or if you just do some searching around same. And then kind of finally, and going back to it, right, remember, look for a tool, right? You know, we all know, right, the challenge of today's data is both structured and unstructured. Find a tool and a partner that can help you kind of handle, wrangle both of those challenges that has interfaces that serve your different stakeholders, right? As you start to talk about scaling up AI, right, there's C-level has certain needs and wants, line of business, others has to be approved by IT. We certainly think a lot about uh, making sure we're meeting each of their needs and we provide our uh, user-friendly interface for each that's tightly connected at the back end so folks can kind of collaborate uh, uh, to win. And then obviously, uh, think about those use cases, right? What are the use cases you have that will that are worth, that will have a, 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 a return in the investment you place into them that are discrete, that can be achieved? And certainly, we uh, like to think a lot or focus a lot around helping folks with a bundle, with a package uh, that they can say, yeah, I want that. I like what I saw today, uh, or maybe with these three or four tweaks, can we deploy that? And without having to wait years for, uh, you know, up getting, you know, hiring an army of PhD data scientists or these type of things, we we all we love, you know, uh, we work with teams with organizations that do have those teams all the time, but we work for, with some who aren't. And so people are on that kind of maturity curve, uh, ramping up as organizations. We want to help them, you know, whatever stage of the journey they're at. We do, you know, if folks, uh, kind of final point for me, we do for folks, uh, you know, who want, uh, you know, uh, like I was mentioning, who have that kind of, hey, we, we agree or we think we agree, but I need to get X, Y, and Z stakeholder in the room and we want to work through something. And so we do things like uh, in the first column here, I uh, have a package. If you look at that uh, solution, uh, small, small screen, small words on the page there, but the bottom left, it says idea to insight in 30 days. That's something, a workshop we we do uh, where folks, we get the right people in the room. We even help them identify, okay, can I get the right data for this to help? Can we I map out the process so this could be a, a successful? And with 30 day, within 30 days, we can go from an idea around, yes, I like that thing that you have, or actually I have this other idea around AI and machine learning. And I, I want to know, can we get to insight? Can we become that insights-driven company? And within 30 days, we can help an organization. We come on site, help them uh, get the same, bring the right whole stakeholders in, uh, and so on. And we have other other ones here. You see here, we help people manage it over time if that's what, uh, if they, again, they're, they, that's what they're looking for or, or just learn. To your point, you know, Peggy, we want people to, we want to support the community and learning and growing. And so uh, we certainly off, offer a lot there. So that's mainly what we wanted to share today. We will try to follow up. Um, you're certainly welcome. So we have our contact information there, my personal contact information there. Uh, and then I know we're going to, we'll also be looking to, you know, send send some folks who are to, who attended or registered today some notes if they would like to have a follow-up chat. Uh, we'll try to reach out to folks, but reach out to us as well. That Magellan at opentext.com goes to kind of an entire team of people, and we endeavor very quickly uh, to get folks into the right hands or to the right uh, type of folks to help them with their challenge. Um, and so... Um, we appreciate the opportunity and, and the partnership, and we, we uh, hope we're talking to everyone individually <laughs> uh, uh, in the days or weeks or months to come. Well, thank you. We've been listening to Zach Jarvin. Oh, uh, no, so Peggy, go ahead. Say, got some good questions coming in. 
<laughs> yes, we do. And um, so uh, let me go ahead and jump right into it because we are kind of short on time here. And um, a couple of people asked this question, and I just want to jump right to it, asking about the overlap of this with RPA, robotic process automation. And um, uh, uh, Zach, let me go ahead and turn that to you first. Um, and, and certainly, uh, just your Peggy, chime in, please. Yeah, RPA, you know, it's, you just, you, you know, now there, some people call RPA kind of dumb, you know, AI or machine learning in the sense that it's typically around, uh, you know, triggers, if this and that. Um, so we have some of that built into our technology. And we also, in other cases, if you're using, you know, if you have a, a robust set um, of R, RPA currently uh, 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 within your organization, we also plug into that. I mean, the going back to what Jesse was saying around the value some of the values around automation, which is that's what um, robotic process automation, RPA, is, is aimed uh, to achieve. So great interface uh, or great interlay with many of the same things we use. In some cases, we use it in our own technology. In other cases, we uh, interface with existing RPA systems. I'll just add that um, the, uh, the uh, RPA and low-code platforms used together um, always yield significant and immediate returns. I think the key to long-term success there is just to always remember that that volume of information coming into organizations is exploding and, and most of it is unstructured. And that's why the two fit so well together. Um, I wanna ask this next question of Jesse. Um, <laughs> Uh, since, since you're out with clients and you're facing, uh, you're working with your client base every day, um, other examples are, uh, that you can share of where these solutions have been used. Um, you know, can, can a solution that, that you talked about handle large volumes of data? Um, just talk a little bit about some other use case examples to put this into context. Yeah, that, absolutely. I've been, um, just recently, I've been working with a, a very large insurance company um, to handle their an incredibly large amount of inbound communication they receive on a, a daily basis. Um, the, uh, the initial use case we're tackling was focused around emails, and, and not just emails themselves, but around attachments that go along with said emails. Um, there is a uh, very large need to not, not only automate that, but be able to prioritize it and do risk assessment on it as real time as well. So when you get all of these inbound emails and communication, um, we obviously want to automate as much as possible, reduce the amount of manual intervention. Um, that's a very important value piece of uh, this kind of whole use case. Um, but they have another really, really important part as well for them, which has to do with identifying things like potential litigation, right? When, when you're in that type of an industry, um, that's a very real possibility. And, and in addition to just routing content, um, being able to do risk assessment and prioritize this content um, especially when there's things like a um, threat of litigation or things of that nature becomes very, very critical beyond just the, the value of automation. It's a huge savings in potential risk and other losses by identifying this very particular type of content in a very accurate manner and being able to handle it in a very, very short time frame. Um, and so, and, and to kind of touch on, on the volume side of that, um, we're talking very, very large volumes of content. So we can, you know, scale out to really just about anything that's there. But I mean, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of communications a day. Thanks, Jesse. That was really helpful. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things here that we do have a companion infographic, and if you look to the resources section, uh, if you haven't already gotten it from AIM, um, it's, it is in the list there for uh, um, some additional uh, facts and stats that are listed in here that just might help you make the case and uh, to, to some good information to share with you. And also wanted to mention here, um, AIM's Certified Information Professional certification that we offer. Um, and also leading up to this, you know, AIM offers live instructor-led training, and this training is very helpful in the learning path for getting your CIP. And, and this certification is dedicated to enhancing and promoting the profession of information management. And there is a class that we have called the Fundamentals of Intelligent Information Management, and, and it's not only a great overview of all things 
I, I am. But it is a great way to prepare for taking the exam. Um, uh, personally, that, that's a route that I took for myself. So it's a really great course. And it was just revised. Not only was this program revised, but the CIP exam itself was revised earlier this year. So everything is very current on the latest happening in our industry. Um, and all, all the information about the CIP and the training program can all be found at aim.org slash training. And since we're at the end of our webinar time, I want to thank you very much. Um, we have recorded the webinar. I invite you to come back, listen to it again, uh, and, and we're going to be sending a link out to, for this replay so that uh, you'll be able to catch that and invite others to listen to it. Do download the resources. The Open Text folks have provided a, a wealth of, of additional learning resources for you in, in addition to what we have stuck in there from AIM. And certainly when you download the PDF of the slides, all of the links from all of those great resources pages that uh, Zach mentioned towards the end are all available to you to be able to connect through and see what they have there. Very much want to thank our underwriter, OpenText. Um, without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our, this webinar series. So thank you for your sponsorship. It's greatly appreciated. And as we bring this webinar to a close, um, I just want to leave everyone with um, the closing thoughts of each of our speakers. And I'm going to start first with uh, Jesse Freeman from Open Text. Your closing thoughts today. Not sure if I'm not hearing Jesse. I, I'll, I'll say I'm on our end, um, Teresa. I'm, I'm get started. Uh, we seem to be having problems with Jesse sound. So, yep. uh, Zach Charbonin. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm here now, Teresa. I, I apologize for that. Okay, go right ahead. Um, you know, I, I wanted to say that the, you know, the, the one thing I, I kind of want everyone to think about and, and take away from this when we really go into machine learning and AI is to um, really think about how it, it's not a magic bullet that you're going to point at a problem and, and get an immediate answer from. Um, it is something that, you know, takes some, some time and effort to really um, derive the insights out of, and it can be incredibly valuable, um, but it's, it's not a, a magic bullet or an immediate solution. So as, as everyone starts getting deeper into this and, and realizing the value from it, um, I just want everyone to kind of keep in mind that, like anything, there will be some effort required put in to, to get the value back out. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and Jack, uh, Zach Jarvin, in uh, your closing thoughts today. Yeah, get thank you. Get started. Have a use case like Jesse's mentioning. Uh, have a good partner that can help navigate you through those challenges, uh, and uh, make sure you have the data as well, or, or make sure you can get. Don't be stingy with your data. Sometimes we we in big organizations we have our data in silos, and so we need to. You know, collaborative as we move towards insights driven, we need to be able to make sure, for instance, data scientists or the machine has access to the data for it to learn on. Thanks, Zach. And, and Peggy Winston for me, your closing thoughts. Great, yes. great, great segue. I couldn't have asked uh, for a better segue from you, Zach. Um, a little reality check 54% of the information about our customers doesn't even live in what we in this industry would have expected as a dedicated content management system. So think about that. Where is that really good information? Well, it's in other really impactful business systems. And those are the ones that are usually customer facing, things like ERP systems or um, HR onboarding that was mentioned earlier. Think about where the very best customer information lies and try to figure out um, just the easiest and quickest way to extract that. As, as Zach said, don't be stingy. Um, we're all uh, brokers of information now, uh, particularly with our customers. Thanks, Peggy. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. I, I greatly value that you are here, and we'll look forward to you being on our next webinar. Have a great afternoon.